are. The number one, I love intelligence. I love wickedly intelligent people. I try to hire as many of them as possible, learn from them. But what's more valuable than intelligence is hunger. You find, if you looked at, what's the common denominator between Richard Branson, Mark Benioff, you know, you, give me your list of whoever it is. I guarantee if you dig underneath, their hunger has never gone away. Some people get hungry because they got a goal to you know, achieve something or get in a swimsuit by a certain date or some stuff. But that's not, a, that's not an identity change, right? These are people that are like myself. I'm hungry today at 57 more than I was at 26. You know, I can, I, I feel in me. And when I say hungry, I'm hungry to contribute, to learn, to grow, to make a difference. I, I'll never settle less than I can be or do or share or give or create. And everyone I know that's successful, that's the driving force. Because with that hunger, you can get the skill. With that hunger, you can figure it out. With that, there are a lot of very smart people who can't fight their way out of a paper bag in a pragmatic way. So let's get into an issue that I think hinders a lot of people on their road to success, getting the momentum. Yes, can I show the little yes. graphic here for a second? So just, this is so simple, and I think you all find it useful. Can I just ask all of you, what do you think the potential is for any human being to live the life they want? What would you say? <laughs> okay, some, two people said unlimited, everybody else is quiet. <laughs> How many would agree it's really unlimited, potential at least? If you do, give me a yeah. yes. Yeah. So if our potential is unlimited, the question is, do most people's results in life reflect their true potential? Would you say yes or no? no. Absolutely not. Why not? You tell me. Well, a lot of people say because they don't take action. I kind of led you with this, right? Yes. But you could be a salesman and you can knock on 100 doors and say, you don't want to buy anything from me, would you? You may not say that verbally, but your fear, your emotion could do that. Somebody's going to buy from you out of pity. So a lot of action is helpful, but if you're not certain it's going to work, you won't execute. That's when people say, I tried that. And whenever you say I've tried that, I know they didn't do the right thing. So I created this graphic, and you might want to jot it down, those of you at home or yourself, these four words, potential, action, results, and then belief or certainty. And here's how they work in a, in a circle. Our potential's amazing, but if you don't believe something's gonna work, if you've tried to lose weight before, and you tried to diet, and it didn't work out well, you don't, you don't feel certain anymore, and you're also fearful of failing. So when you're uncertain, do you tap full potential, yes or no? No, and when you don't think it's gonna work, you not only don't take full potential, but are you gonna take massive action when you think it's not gonna work anyway? Yeah. So when you use little potential with little action, what kind of results are you gonna get? Yeah. Lousy results, when you get lousy results, what does it do to your belief? Your brain goes, see, I told you it wouldn't work. See, I told you nothing never happened, see? And then what happens? Less potentials tap, less action, worse results, and now you're on the downward spiral. Who's ever been there in a relationship or with your body, your finances, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now you might be doing well in one area, like with your kids, you got great movement, but maybe on your finances, not so good. So sometimes we're going in different directions. So how would you change this? What would you guys do? Someone yell it out. What would you do to change the momentum? Where would you enter? Would you work on your potential? That's right, you got a belief. So how do you change your belief? The way you do it with athletes, because I worked with like the Warriors last year, I worked with the, Golden, uh, the, the uh, NHL champion Stanley Cup, Washington Capitals. You get results in advance. They visualize it, as simple as that sounds, but I'm gonna show you. Can we pop over Please, here? Yeah. Would you all stand up and I'll show you a quick technique. Oh, we got a technique. We have to learn this right now. <laughs> now come on over Simple. here. Put your, over here? Yeah. Put your feet together straight ahead and then bring your right index forward straight in front of you. And when I say now, I want you to turn clockwise comfortably just as far as you naturally turn, okay? Keep your feet straight, go. Turn clockwise naturally. Everyone at home can do it too. Keep your feet straight. See where you end up? Come back around. Take your finger out of your neighbor's ear. <laughs> okay, now close your eyes, it's so simple. You, even if you don't think you visualize, you can feel. So I want you to imagine your finger coming up, but imagine it so vividly, it feels like it's coming up. Don't actually do it if you're at home or here, but imagine the finger comes up, and then imagine yourself turning twice as far, and it feels really good. See it, feel it. Open your eyes. Now, turn your finger straight, and now turn as far as you can comfortably and see where you go this time. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> so here's my question. Here's my question. How many of you, how many of you went significantly further? How many went at least 25% further this time? Okay, go. So here's my quick question. Did you have the potential to turn that far the first time? Yes. The potential. Yes. Potential, yes. Yes. So why didn't you? Because you have beliefs even about how far you can turn even though you're unaware of them. So you have beliefs about money, you have beliefs about relationship, you have beliefs about business, you have beliefs about your own beauty or strength. And so the way to change them, this is the simplest way I could show you in two minutes, is to condition your mind. Because once the mind is certain, the body will go there. Or once the mind is certain, the emotion
we went ice racing, a group of my friends and I were with me, and my, some of them are my security guards, some of them are my co-workers, some are partners I have in business, but we went 70 kilometers below the, the equator and just, or excuse me, the Arctic, and went 200 miles an hour and Lamborghinis. I was doing it like this. <laughs> I, I, I love that you said you're stuck and you went, you did this versus like get, going to a spa and getting pedicures. Yeah, like going through that shit. So, uh, <laughs> so I was able to squeeze in a Porsche and if you can imagine 200 kilometers an hour on pure ice on a lake that's frozen as fast as you can drive. And the beautiful thing about it is like, you know, most people have fears and, and I've learned to make sure I give myself enough fear to stay intelligent. But here you didn't have to have it because when you wrecked, you just went straight into the snow. It was just incredible. So, but we do crazy <laughs> things together. We have a blast together. We laugh. You know, we cry. We see the impact. And to me, I, there is no dividing line. And for my kids, you know, like all the work we do feeding people. My youngest son, Jarek, when he was five or maybe six, probably five, uh, we would go and even in the early days, I was feeding families and I'd take all my friends and we'd build these baskets up, make them great. And we, we'd fed all the families. We had some food left, some baskets left. So we went to this place in Oceanside, this park, and there was a man lying on the ground in the toilet area, covered with a bunch of pieces of rags. And so, you know, I gave it to my son and I said, come on, he could barely hold the thing. It was so big. I said, you know, we're going to help you give this to this man. He goes and so he set it down next to the man. All of a sudden, the man jumped up and grabbed my son's hand. And I jumped, my son jumped, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then he just did this. And he put it down. My son is 30, what, one years old now, 32 years old now. He's just gotten married. He was working on kids. His entire life is about contribution. He's got a heart this big. He works his ass off. But he does it in a way that's so fulfilling. And his wife travels with them, and they have this great life. And he doesn't have to pick between work mm -hmm. and mission. And he's not burnt out. And he's probably been to 100 countries. And I'm proud. How did you, how did you model the financial industry? How did you model pistol shooting, which is an amazing story of somebody who does not know how to shoot pistols yeah. and yet teaches the best marksman in the world <laughs> how to do it fast. I mean, it's like yeah. utterly insane, but it showed me that you can take anything and figure out what the, the commonalities are in the best people and then yeah. pull that into your own system. It really started, my very first teacher was a man named Jim Rohn. Um, and he was a personal development speaker. And he had this three and a half hour seminar he would do that I went to when I was 17 years old. I was already reading books. I was obsessed with wanting answers. I want to know what makes the difference in the quality of people's lives. Not because I was intellectually interested, but because I grew up in a really tough environment. I had four different fathers. There was a lot of, uh, my mom was a great human being who loved me dearly, but she you know, abused both alcohol and prescription drugs. So she was very physically abusive. And I was, believe it or not, 5'1 in high school. I was a little guy. So right. I got the, you know what, beat out of me pretty regularly for things that I didn't do anything to do with. And so it, it made me try to figure out what made her work, what makes life work. It made me more of a practical psychologist. And... The modeling concept came because Jim Rohn used to have this phrase, he said, success leaves clues. He said, if, if there's anything you want in your life, don't assume that somebody has some special gift. They may have a gift, but they probably developed it, most of it. And if you sow the same seeds, you'll reap the same reward. So figure out what this person's doing different than anyone else and do that. He, he used to have a funny way of describing it. He used to say, Tony, find out what poor people read and don't read it. <laughs> you know, it's like, because he said, that's the fabric they're trying to build their mind from. Find out somebody who's successful, wealthy, not just financially wealthy, but somebody who's rich emotionally and spiritually and physically and financially, and find out how do they live their life differently? What are the things they believe? What are, they, what are some of the daily disciplines that they're a part of? And so really early on, I got obsessive about wanting to have all the answers. So I said, I'm gonna read a book a day. Because I figured, you know, a person takes 10, 15 years of their life, they pour two or three, four years into this book, and you absorb in a few hours, literally a decade's worth of life experience. And I'm into compressing time. So I didn't read a book a day, but I read 700 books in the area of human development, psychology, physiology, all in my first real seven years of reading, right? My wow. youth. In high school, I was Mr. Solution. You have a problem, I have a solution. Especially if you're a girl, I was especially motivated. <laughs> I could really help you with your boyfriend. <laughs> but seriously, I... So out of that, I started to develop this modeling concept. And then I learned neurolinguistic programming, or NLP. Yep. 
and gestalt therapy and hypno Ericksonian hypnosis. And I learned all these tools. But along the way, John Grinder, who was the co-founder of NLP, said, I said to him, I said, NLP isn't all these patterns. You could teach a dog patterns. They're beautiful patterns, don't get me wrong. How to overcome a phobia, how to do those things. I learned how to do all that. But I was, I was bored with that. I wanted, to, I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to figure out how you change the whole person, not just their fear in this one area or get them to perform at a different level. And so I said to him, I said, really, your skill, NLP is really modeling. He said, Tony, no one's ever said that before. I said, you went out and you figured out the best patterns from the best therapists in the world, and you modeled those patterns and you integrated them with other tools, and now anyone can do them, right? Not right. just the great person. And so it kind of started with that for me. And then, uh, you know, with the, I, I became partners with John in a very short period of time. It was, it was kind of, uh, people were upset about it because I'd only been in, involved in NLP for less than four months, right. and people have been involved for 10 years and wanted to be his partner. So it was kind of controversial. but. Part of what I did was I said, I want to go and do things that people think are impossible. I want to, I want to take somebody who's in a coma and get them out. You know, I want to, uh, you know, I want to take on the U.S. Army and say, show us anything you can do and I'll cut the training time in half and increase the competency. And so John agreed. And the first big project I got was the pistol shooting program. And I went to this general and said, I can cut the training time in half on anything. I didn't know pistol shooting. And I said, uh, and he goes, you know, you're crazy. I said, no, I'm expensive. We kind of negotiated. And so the first thing he picks is this four-day pistol shooting program that they had worked on for, you know, almost 75 years. And he says to me, go do this. You know, right now we have a third of the people that don't never qualify. Right. And I said, okay. And I, I thought I'd pull it off because John was my partner. He was in the special forces. We'll figure it out. The day I'm supposed to go, this is the great gift that John gave me. The day I'm supposed to go with him down to Langley, Virginia and go underground in the secret area and work with all these different guys and kind of figure out how to model them. I figure I'm gonna learn from John. He's the best model in the world. He calls me up from a pay telephone in San Jose and says, I'm getting on a plane. I gotta to go to Germany. It's an emergency. You're on your own, brother. And he hangs up. Oh. So now I've never should have gone before <laughs> in my life. I look like I'm 13. I was 24 years old, right? But I look like a little kid. I have such a young face. And I go meet these guys who've been shooting 24 years, or one right. guy. One was the best shooter in, in the armed forces as a whole. One was the best in the army and one was the best instructor. And so they walked in and said, where's the instructor? And I'm wearing jeans and a t-shirt, right? right? And I go, I'm him. And they, where's the instructor? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm him. And they go, how long have you been shooting? I said, well, I never shot a gun before, but this will be interesting, <laughs> right? So these guys look at me like I'm completely insane. I said, I don't even oh, shot yeah. a gun to model you. I'm gonna extract from you what works. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I acted as if. I just like, I said, okay, how would I do this? Well, everything we do externally starts with something internal. Right. We have an internal process, a visualization. We have internal dialogue, we say. And if you use one dialogue or one visualization or one way of using your body, you're gonna feel and behave differently than if you use another. So I got all three of them up there and I said, here's what I want you to do. Take the gun, take the bullets out. You know, first of all, they made me shoot a gun. They go, let's see you shoot. So they took a 45 caliber pistol. I had never used one before. And I didn't know how to kick. And I shot the thing and it went up in the ceiling because you know the ricochet off, it didn't build confidence. But I eventually I said, look, take your gun out and I had him start practicing, I'd stop, what are you doing, what are you doing? And the long story short, over a period of maybe three or four hours, I figured there were a lot of things idiosyncratic, unique to each of them, but there were some universals. And one of the most important universals that they all did, and they weren't even aware of it, it was subconscious was, right. when they took the target, like I saw the target 30 yards away and it looked forever away, they mentally bring the target closer. And when it's closer, you feel more certain, and when you feel more certain, you fire them more effectively. Every single one did it, and none of them were consciously aware of it. Once I understood that, I didn't just take new people and train them mentally to bring it closer. The first time I had people shooting again, they practiced everything perfectly, just like the best guys in the world. And the first time they shot it, the target was where you are, and I'm right here. <laughs> ba boom right through the middle. Wow, I got this thing down, versus me shooting the bullet in the ceiling, and then you right. lose all your confidence. So we do that like 20 times, and I take it 10 feet, and then 20 feet, you know, and then 30 yards. And it qualified 100% of the people. Wow. And we did it in a day and a half, not four days. Tripled the number of people who played at the expert level. And the colonel reported the general was the first breakthrough in pistol shooting since World War I. I would say the 30-year-old would say, this is what we're going to do this year, and it would be these huge numbers. And I developed a principle around the time I was 30, which is most of us overestimate what we're going to do in a year. And we underestimate what we're going to do in a decade. And a decade happens that fast. You'll blink your eyes and a decade point. will be here. That and is so a great point. I really, truly, I, everything I do is long term. I think it's yeah. the biggest challenge we have in, in yeah. you know, corporate America is everybody's looking at the next quarter. Instead of you know, the best business people, the Mark Benioffs, the Steve Wins, the you know, Peter Goobers, the people that I hang with, they all are decade-long people. When I was 
14, I said, this is how my life's gonna, I decided. I said, in my 20s, I'm gonna help. I wanna have the skill to help anyone change their life. If I'm committed and they're committed, it's gonna be done, I'll have the ability. So I got a build to that, which I did. And then I said, in my 30s, at 14, I said, I'll do that with groups of people instead of one-on-one. -on -one. And then in my 40s, I'll do it with big groups. In my 50s, I'll do it with companies. In my 60s, I'll either do it in government as a servant there or in a religious context, because I'm a spiritual person, but I don't tell people what to believe religiously. But at that point, I've lived long enough, maybe I will. And when I look at how to create answers, I don't look for the excuses. I look for what can be done. And what I found is this. When I first did this at TED years ago, I asked this question, because I walked in, one of the only times it was about as quiet as this room. And I asked people, and you know, the room in those days was very small. It was the heads of Google, the guys from Yahoo, Steve Jobs was in the room, pretty great group. In fact, it was the day that they came out with a technology that made this happen. They showed it for the first time from MIT. They pinched things and pictures grew. You can move things with your fingers. And we were so blown away. And Microsoft went in and bought the entire thing that was demonstrated. It was a tabletop with pictures. And Steve Jobs quietly walked back and went, I'm gonna use that for a phone and change the world, right? So here's what I said that day. I asked this question. I said, how many of you have ever failed? Not one hand went up. I said, I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. And I said, how many of you failed? And now everybody raised their hand. And I said, when you failed, why'd you fail? And I heard some of the same things I heard here. What were the things people said? Didn't have enough time. Didn't have enough capital. Didn't have the right technology. Didn't have the right contacts, right? Didn't have the right people. Didn't have all these things. And in the voice in the darkness, because it's a very dark room, I heard this voice say, didn't have enough Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and I looked out, it was Al Gore. <laughs> Vice President Al Gore there. And, and everybody started clapping, right, like crazy. And I looked at him and I said, that's one way to explain why you didn't become President of the United States. But I said, it's not an accurate one. I said, of course, easy for me to say, I never ran for president. But let's see if what you guys, if I'm true or not. When you told me all the reasons why you failed, you told me resources you were lacking. Courage is a resource, right? Time is a resource. Money is a resource. People are a resource. Technology is a resource. But here's the challenge. Resources are never the real problem. We all know it if we look around. Think about it. You can get the resources if you're resourceful enough. Resources are not the challenge, it's resourcefulness. So what is it we're really missing? It's some form of human emotion that we have learned to value less and less in a technologically driven society. See, if you're creative enough, can you get the answer, yes or no? Yes or no? And creativity is a resource. If you're committed enough, can you get the capital, yes or no? If you care deeply enough for other people, will you get people to help you, yes or no? Are the answers there if you're resourceful enough, yes or no? And in fact, whenever you see people in business that fail, they'll always tell you they were missing resources when they really just weren't resourceful enough. This man is incredibly resourceful. I'm resourceful. Every person that I work with who's gone from nothing to a billionaire, and I've interviewed 50 of them just in the last four years to give you an idea, which is why I gave you that book. I'm not gonna talk about that. I just want to give you a gift because I literally spent four years of my life interviewing these people. And they, none of the people I interviewed were from the Lucky Sperm Club. They all built it from scratch. They did it by doing one simple thing you gotta do in business, which is finding a way to do more for others than who? Than you, yourself, but more than anyone else in the industry. You gotta find a way to add more what? And when I did these interviews, one of the things that came across when I was doing this is, these people just took no excuses. They knew they could get the resources if they were resourceful enough. So what are the ultimate resources? Creativity, joy, Love, determination, flexibility. With those things, there's nothing we can't get. Who agrees with me on this? Say I. I. And then I turned back to Vice President Al Gore and I said, you know, so I heard you say you didn't have enough Supreme Court justices, but last night I watched you give a speech and he gave his inconvenient truth speech for the first time and he was so passionate. Al Gore was passionate. It was an amazing thing. I'd never seen it before. And I said to him, I've never seen you that passionate ever before. I said, I watched the debate between you and George W. Bush, and I wanted to vote for you, but I couldn't. You just didn't have the energy. You kind of had an attitude. I said, you were not resourceful. I said, it never should have come down to justice as having to make that decision. It's because you were not resourceful enough. 
And there's this pause in the room, and all of a sudden, everybody stood up in Democratic Northern California and started clapping like crazy. And Al stood up and came by and gave me a little high five, a little hug. And afterwards, they said, get him run for president again. I said, no, no, no. But the point is, it's resources. High energy, two high energy people, what kind of relationship are they gonna have? If they're both feeling great, what's the relationship gonna be like? Come on, tell me. Are they gonna deal with challenges in a great state, yes or no? So our state is the most important thing that influences our capability, our results in life. Lots of people have capability, but activating it comes from energy. When you are energy rich, you have a different life. The higher the energy, the more things can get done. If there are problems in your high energy state, can you solve them quicker? Yes or no? Yes. And what if you got two people in a medium, like, okay state? It's not even about each other. Their life is kind of okay. What's the relationship like? Come on, guys, what is it? Okay. It's okay. What if you got two people in a crappy state, in a lousy state, and they love each other? What's still going to happen? Tell me quick. It's going to be a lousy relationship. You're going to have pain. You're going to have problems. That's also true in business. The more energy you have, the more things can be organized quicker, faster, make it happen. You can solve problems. When you're energy poor, even smart people don't maximize. And the problem is in our culture today, because of technology, technology is starting to condition us instead of us just condition the technology. Today, we sit so passively. If you walk into most businesses today, everybody's in a deep trance. And you can see it, because there's very few rooms that I walked in that are as dead as this one was when we started here. And yet, I know you're not dead. You're the peak of performers in the world. But we're internal when I say that. And there's nothing wrong with being internal, but there are times we got to be externalized to make it work. Who's with me on this? Say, I. And so what I'd like to do is let's see if we can do something a little different. Because what we don't want to leave here with is have you come here, listen, and hear those interesting thoughts and go on. We want to go home and make the shifts in our lives. Who's up for it? Say aye. aye. So to do that, we're going to do some unconventional things to get things moving in here so we have a different level of energy. So I'd like you to find somebody nearby right now, point at them and go, I own you. <laughs> no, say it like you mean it. I own you. <laughs> no, say it with more intensity. I own you. You. Now, when you say I own you, what you're really saying in that moment is, I am challenging you, you low energy person. <laughs> and what we're going to do is, where does energy come from, ladies and gentlemen? Someone tell me, where does energy come from? Food. Does energy come from food? <laughs> How many of you remember last Thanksgiving, where you were last Thanksgiving? Yes, and at Thanksgiving, what'd you do? You had plenty of food, and after you ate everything in sight and said, I'll never eat again, and someone said, pie, and you went, okay. <laughs> Who remembers? And at the end of that, what did you do? Go for a run? What did you feel like after all that food? Tell me. You wanna lie down and go to sleep? There's no energy, there's no productivity, there's no joy, there's just sleep, right? So it's not food. Where does the energy come from? Come on. How many agree with me that if without energy, we are not going to maximize? If you agree, raise your hand and shout yes. yes. Thank you very much. So let's start to create that energy. So where is it coming from? It's not food. Yes. Sleep. How many have ever slept for eight hours and you're still freaking tired? Raise your hand. How many know people that look tired just to be around them? They make you feel tired. Say, ah. So it's not sleep. Who's ever had a night when you had no sleep whatsoever, you're totally exhausted, and boom, something happened and you're awake for hours? Who knows what I'm talking about? Say, I. I. I would say to you where the energy comes from is psychology. It's a decision about who you're going to be and what you're going to tolerate or not in yourself. And those are the highest energy. If I said to you, Richard Branson, energy rich or energy poor? Quick. Rich. Okay, Mark Benioff, energy rich or energy poor? Rich. Yes. The room when I walked in here, energy rich, energy poor? poor. Good, so should we change that, yes or no? Yes. Good, unless, when I say, point somebody and say, playfully, you turn them, I own you, what you're really doing is challenging them. And I want to see if you can do something fun. I do this with the best athletes in the world, presidents, you name it, sounds crazy. But what we want to do is we found that you can change your energy just by changing the way you move for a few moments, if you decide to. Energy equals emotion. Emotion is energy in motion. And so if you try to get yourself pumped up in your head, you go in circles. And we're not looking for a pump up, we're looking for fuel. Fuel that will move things. Well, if you're entrepreneurs out there, I, here's what I'd say to you. I'd say, don't be so damn hard on yourself. I know that sounds counter to being an achiever, but when you're beating yourself up, you're sucking out the energy you need to move forward. 
it's kind of like, uh, I always tell people there's so much energy and I've built mine, I do a lot of things to build my energy to be incredibly strong and have really strong endurance because to me, energy is life. If you don't have strong energy, you're not gonna do anything. But even after we look at that energy, it only goes so many places. So if your energy is being caught up, if you take energy in a business and you pour it into external marketing, going out and reaching people and adding value, that business is gonna grow. But if there are inner conflicts in that business between people, then the energy is being sucked in here and less energy is going out there, the business is gonna have problems. That's also true of you. If you allow your disappointments to create these inner conflicts and fears and you let them run wild within you, they're gonna suck the energy out you need to go to the next level in your business. You have to discipline your disappointment now. You know, mine is the 90 second rule. So watch this, try something real fast. Look around this room, I'm gonna give you a test. Look around this room and see everything that's brown. I'm gonna test you in a moment. Look behind you, look around you, look at clothing, look at people, look anything that's brown. Brown, 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 record it in your mind. Close your eyes. Now, with your eyes closed, tell me everything you saw just now that was red. <laughs> if you see more brown than red, say aye. Open your eyes, look for red now. Really look for red, look for it anywhere you can find it. Look around you, look beside you, look in front, back. How many found more red this time? Raise your hand if you did, say aye. Why'd you find more red this time? Because you told me to. Seek and ye shall find. But here's what's amazing. Seek and you shall find even if it's not there. I'll prove it to you. How many saw beige shit called it brown just to feel successful? <laughs> How many saw burgundy called it red just to so count more pieces? So if you think you're a jerk or someone else is a jerk, you're gonna color it, you're gonna change it, you're gonna find the jerkiness in them, you're gonna find the jerk in you. It's really important that you manage your mental and emotional state because you are the business. If you are the leader, your responsibility, your job, your opportunity, your privilege, is to be able to truly lead. And you cannot lead if you're living in fear. You cannot lead in a place of constant uncertainty. We all have uncertainty at times. But if you watch an athlete go out to shoot a free throw or a kicker in, in the NFL to go kick the ball, how many have ever seen that person? They're about to kick it, they're about to shoot it, and you go, they're gonna miss it, and you know they're gonna miss it. Who's experienced this before? How did you know? You could see in their body that they're missing the core ingredient, absolute certainty. You can have the great skills in the world, but when you lose that certainty, the athlete goes down. That's usually when I get the call. I gotta rewire them and get them back where they can execute at that level. So be kind to yourself, as corny as that sounds, not to be kind to yourself, but so there's more energy available to solve the problems and to build the business and to meet your mission. Because the time you're beating yourself up, you're trying to prove to yourself you really care, but meanwhile, what you're doing is sucking the energy out of your growth. I had somebody who embezzled some money when I was a tiny company, like one of the companies was $3 million. And the guy embezzled a quarter of a million dollars, and I was $758,000 in debt and thought I was in profit. And in those days, you know, everybody told me I'd have to go bankrupt. And I remember I was just like so angry. There was so much anger because my business was like my child, and this guy tried to kill my child, you know? So I was chasing him into Mexico so I could beat the hell out of him and put him in prison. And, <laughs> and, um, and then I realized in the middle of this stuff, I gotta let go of this because while I'm busy being angry and pissed off, the business is gonna go under. I'm chasing birds, what am I do when I catch the bird? I gotta focus on how to add the value. And so take your energy, that's all you have in this life, and invest it in the things you love. In those you love, in the mission of your business, and in your clients. If you fall in love with what you do, who you do it with, and who you do it for, there'll be no limit to your impact, but you gotta be willing to do it for decades, because it's all bullshit. Maybe you'll hit the lucky thing and it'll happen in 12 months, but even if you don't, even if you did, you know, uh, I got a friend who's one of my partners in the LAFC and so forth, you know, Chad, who started YouTube, for example, and $1.6 billion in what, 18 months, 24 months, that type of thing. It's not always the best thing because ultimately in life, whenever you meet people who have succeeded, almost always we talk about the toughest times and laugh and remember, because in order to have a foreground, you need a background. And to appreciate the foreground, you need a background. So I found that the most difficult times have been the best times because they've made me appreciate what my life is like today.
the, the dry part is falling in love with your customers. I, I love people, I've always loved people, and I hate suffering because I've suffered, and I love to light people up, and not just light them up, pump them up. I love to have them have a skill, have them a tool, have a system. You know, when I do my boot camps each year for um, our business mastery programs, I guarantee everybody there on the day one, you'll have a million dollars of value in your opinion, or we'll give you, keep all the stuff you got and we'll give you your money back. No one ever leaves because I know how to add that value in the business for those people. So I think the drive is, the biggest mistake I think businesses make is many businesses are start by people that you built the product you love. And that may still be true for you. Like you built this great jewelry or you built this great software or, you, or whatever skill set you have. But the problem is the world changes so fast now. I mean, I'm old enough, who remembers the Sony Walkman? Anybody ancient enough to remember <laughs> that yet? That, that product lasted 20 years. Now a product like that won't even last a year, right? The competition is too high. So today, if you and I are gonna really succeed, you gotta fall in love with your ideal customer. Because look, I'm sure you know that right now the economy we have is looking pretty good, but it's gonna correct because we've done nothing since 2008 except print more money. And we didn't even print money, we put you know, ones and zeros in computers. So there's gonna be some corrections, and when those happens, it's gonna shake people up. You need to fall in love with a client who's gonna do well with you even when the economy goes to hell. Think about it, Starbucks, I was sitting across from Howard Schultz and had a great conversation and said, what is he most proud of? And he said, he used to say starting Starbucks. Then he said, now it's surviving 2008. If they closed, I think it was 1,300 stores, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. for $2 coffee. So you need to get your ass ready for winter, because it's coming. And if you have got challenges now, <laughs> but if you do, if you do well in winter, you'll dominate for the rest of the time. And How the way you do well in winter is you fall in love with your ideal clients, and then you come up with the irresistible offer for them. You know, uh, Steve Jobs created 99 cent songs, but he didn't create that shit. We all know that. Where'd it come from? Who's old enough to remember Columbia House, where you got like 10 albums for a buck? Remember that? Or for a quarter and stuff. <laughs> They built a billion dollar company. Tom Shoes, shitty product. I love him, great, great what he does, but, <laughs> but two for one, being able to do something where I get it and I benefit somebody else, brilliant idea. Built the whole company on that. He didn't build it on the product. He built it on the mission, right? So you need an irresistible offer for the client who is ideal for you and you wanna fall in love with a client. Don't fall in love with your product or service because those need to change. And if you fall in love with your product or service, somebody's gonna beat you. They're gonna be anticipating. I always tell businesses, there's two businesses you have to run, manage, right now. You have to run the business you're in, because if you don't run that, your cash flow, your challenges are gonna bite you. But you also have to run the business you're becoming. And both businesses you have to make progress on. If you get all excited about the future and all the cool stuff that's coming, and you go work on that, and there's no cash flow now, you're dead in the water. If you just work on today, you're gonna wake up and go, what the hell happened, my competition beat me. It's those two sides, and, and my 33 companies, I look at what the company is now and what it has to be constantly. So we're, we're doing the, the, you know, the, the grunt work, if you will, the important day-to-day -day work, while we're anticipating the future. And, but the issue of time is not the real issue. The real issue is that they're operating as an operator, not an owner. Yeah. And so what I start to do in the beginning, you have to do both, right? But what I start to do is show them how you have to be able to break off and get other people to do things. But more importantly, I teach people, I do a, you know, a five-day boot camp, you know, I call Business Mastery, a couple times a year, and we bring in businesses from all over the world, literally, and we have people just starting a business, and we have people with, you know, businesses that are doing a billion, two billion, three. And what you find is that there's a common pattern amongst all these group of people where they, they find themselves, if, they're, if it's a small business, they do everything because they figure like they're the only one can do it, or they tried someone else and they failed. Well, that happens in every business. You have to begin to leverage yourself, or you're just gonna be self-employed and you'll never have the scalability. A business is a system that adds value even when you're not there. And you as a leader have to get good enough to both hire people and train people so that you're not a manager. A manager works with people to make sure they get the job done while you're there. But if you have to be there, there's, could I run 33 companies? I mean, every four days I'm gonna plane train helicopter on stage somewhere on average in a year, and I got 33 companies. There's 12 I manage directly, but I couldn't do that by management. I do it by leadership. I build leaders who can make their own decisions. I hire people that are the best of the best. Now in the beginning, that's hard because you have no money, right? So you hire the best, it's called you, and you pay them nothing, right? <laughs> and then now you try to hire other people, and what do you do? You hire your friends, which you know is a disaster because they're not as skilled, and you love them, and it's hard to manage them. And then I hired people that were really talented, but they were mean, you know? They didn't share my values. And so eventually you get to that place where you can find the right people, but I think the most important secret for the growth of any business, the question I guess on how to get over the time, and the answer is you gotta take two hours, 90 minutes a week with your team of one, two, three, 2,000, and you gotta meet where you work on the business. And I teach people a format called 7-7, where 
There are seven areas of a business that you cannot miss. Marketing, sales, optimization, the financials, culture. And I'll make sure that each week you and your team focus on that. Not the day-to-day -day business, but how do we strengthen our marketing not just for this run, but overall, how we build the brand. What do we do to change our sales process? How do we optimize the business? How do we spend no money and grow the business 30% in the next three to six months? And when you take small markers in the business that are critical and you improve them five, 10, 15%, but you do 12 of them, you'll grow your business 120, 130%, 140% because there's a compounding impact. You don't just get the improvement you've made. So I try to help businesses to make those changes so that so you have time to think and be strategic because if you're just running, how many of you are stressed? I'll be honest, I'll be honest if you would. Today, being here and not being at your business, how many feel some stress in your business being away even for a day? Okay, right now, I'm a business operator, F that, right? I'm gonna become a business owner, you gotta be. The most important decision you can make above any on the face of the earth is deciding that no matter what happens in your life, no matter what happens, you're gonna live in a beautiful state. And what the hell does that mean? It means that you're not gonna suffer. It means a beautiful state is that you're gonna be happy, and, but that's only one. Or you're gonna feel creative, or you're gonna be passionate, or you're gonna be in awe of something, or you're gonna feel love. Any state that's a beautiful state is really the core essence of who you are without fear, right? All of our suffering as human beings, and I deal with people all the time, I was, I mentioned to you off camera, two people I, I coached yesterday. One's a presidential candidate, and the other one is uh, a rap superstar, right? Both in the same day. And without naming any names, people that have everything, by your point of view, most people's point of view, they have the fame, and they have the love, and millions of people love them, and they have great economics, financial freedom, and they have homes, and they have, they have, they have the fashion, they have everything, they're the shit. I can't tell you how many of them are miserable. Right. The majority are miserable. I'm not bullshitting. I'm the one who gets the phone call from the vast majority. When I say miserable, they're so used to it, some of them don't even realize they're miserable, right. but most do. They get in a place where it's like, how do I keep this up? How do I keep out doing myself? How do I, you know, I built these 32 companies, how to keep all 32 going and make them all grow every mm -hmm. single year, and, and that's not how life is, right? right? And then they worry about what will people think, what will they do? So the decision to say, I am not gonna suffer. That if suffering arises, pain's one thing, suffering's another. Mm. Suffering is when you're like, I, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine is a, a very famous Indian industrialist and a billionaire guy. And he just recently took a sport in India that's been around 2,000 years that almost every village child plays and he turned it into a professional sport. No one had ever made a professional sport, two years ago. He invested, I don't know, I'm making the number up, $20 million in it. In two years, the sport is so successful in India that 500 million people watched the finals. That's amazing. Two months ago. 500 million people, right? So half a billion, that's, you know, that's how it is in India. And people are saying this is gonna be as big as, you know, for them, cricket right. is the ultimate thing, right? Like, big as cricket. So his team valuation, I'm making the number up, I think it's gone to like half a billion dollars in two years from, you know, $25 million. And his team is number two in the whole world, right? Wow. He's got these great players. So I'm with him and he gets a phone call and he's just got done telling me about this great success and where it is and how proud he is and how everyone goes to the games and people are so thrilled and it's just become this movement in India and he created, he's so proud of it. And he gets this phone call and the phone call is from his management team telling him that one of his competitors has just offered four times as much money as he was wow. offering to his top three athletes wow. who are the core of his whole team. Mm. And of course they all took that, right? right? And he was so angry. He was like, I can't even believe this. I, I, these guys were working in shops and right. I, I brought them here and I made them a star on national television and they have no loyalty to me. And he's suffering. And the way you suffer is you focus on yourself. Right. Suffering comes when we obsess about ourselves, what we're getting or not getting, what we should have done, what we sh others should have done for us. It's the me, 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 me game. Right. You, my dear friend, and I say this with no blowing smoke, your primary core is a giver, which is why you're prospering. You're not the me, me, me. You're like, how do I give more, do more, share more, create more? How do we do a better job for our clients? How do we do a better job for our, our, our internal customers who work with us, our partners? Your entire life is that. That's why you're prospering and you're not feeling suffering. But when you do suffer, and I promise you do, <laughs> you, come, you correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, it'll be because you're worrying about something in the future, 
How's this gonna happen? Will this come together? Suffering could be worry, it could be anger, it could be frustration. It's anything that takes you out of a beautiful state. And right. here's what people don't get. You can end suffering by stop focusing on yourself and focus on something you wanna serve greater than yourself. Right. Your children, your wife, your mission, your life. You can get out of it in an instant because the nature of the human mind is to constantly compare things. Your mind, your brain is a two million year old device and it is not designed to make you happy. It's designed to make you, it's designed to make you survive. Right. And that's why it's always looking for what's wrong. But it used to be what's wrong is saber tooth tiger so I can protect myself. Now right. people are worried about what people think about them or do they have enough money when two thirds of the planet lives on $2 a day right. and you're making $38,000, you're rich. The poorest right. of the poor in our country are considered rich. That's not, I'm not saying they should stay that way. Right. But you can only build on success. And so my view is, if you're watching, if you're listening to this, my goal would have you consider something. Life is short. We don't know how short it's gonna be. But if you only had a week to live, I bet you wouldn't allow yourself to suffer over a little crap that makes you crazy normally. I think you would probably spend time with those you love, you would do what you love, you'd take on a sunset, you'd smell the air, you would take in everything in those so final true. moments that you possibly do. So my thing is why wait, right? Right? Why wait? Why not just decide that if I start to suffer, I know the solution because suffering is me obsessing about me. You might say, it's not me, I'm worried about my kids because they're not doing well. No, you're worried that you haven't done enough for your kids. It's about <laughs> you still, right? Yes. You know, you're worried about what was done or what you should have done or what shouldn't have done. And you can end that in an instant by becoming aware of it and saying, I have made the most important decision of all. Right. I'm gonna live in a beautiful state. Because here's what's gonna happen. Anybody watching, you may lose a family member, you probably will. Somebody may get cancer. Your business may, the government might change the rules. They might change things radically that you can't even do anything about it. You might go bankrupt. You might get divorced. I don't say anybody will, but no, sure. no one knows what's gonna really happen in your life. Life's full of uncertainty, but here's what you can know. You can decide that what happens, you could have a great time. If somebody like Viktor Frankl can be locked up in Auschwitz and come out of that in the experience finding joy in the middle of Auschwitz, then human beings have a capacity they've undersold themselves on. We think that the outside world determines how we feel. If, if people have to behave a certain way, if your husband or your wife or your kids or your coworkers or whoever, your boss, has to behave a certain way for you to be happy, and if they don't, you're unhappy, mm -hmm. then you're always gonna be unhappy, because the more people around you, the more they're gonna change that, because they're all human, right. right? And if you have to be a certain way to be happy, <laughs> you're gonna violate it too. So my invitation is, as great as it is to achieve, more important to enjoy. Right. And if you can enjoy every moment in that state, when you're feeling loving and playful and passionate and curious and awe, you treat other people a hundred times better mm -hmm. than when you're feeling frustrated, pissed off, overwhelmed, worried, stressed, or feeling sorry for yourself. Right. You're gonna be a better parent, you're gonna be a better lover, you're gonna be a better business person, you're gonna have a better life. So my soliloquy is, decide. Decide today and actually say, what if I cut it off? What if I said, I'm not willing to settle and I'm just gonna live in a beautiful state? Doesn't mean you won't feel bad, it means you won't stay there. You right. instantly change. That's doable. I'm on a mission to help people end suffering.